Abe Neufeld passed from this world to the presence of his lord November 22, 2006 at 9.30 p.m. He was 98 years old. He passed away peacefully in the presence of his loving wife Helen and his niece Arlene Snyder, daughter of his late sister Anna. Abraham was born in Knowlton, Alberta to a family of nine children of Jacob Neufeld and Katharina Nee Hebert. He was predecessed by all of his brothers and sisters, Katharina in 1955, Jake 1958, Elizabeth in 1911 at five years of age, Anna in 1998, Cornelius in 1910 at five days, Neil in 1991, Martin in 1978, and Betty, or also known as Beth, in 2005. Abe was predeceased by his first wife, Ruth Lewis, in 1988. He is survived by his second wife, Helen Luer. was a father to his son, Barry Neufeld, and his grandchildren, Martina, Celia, married to Werner Bullock, Jonathan, and Natasha. Jacob and Katharina were married at the Mennonite Church in Rudnerswide, Manitoba, in 1899. This page is from the Old Family Bible. The family homestead was in Knowlton, Northwest Territories, between what is now Didsbury and Acme, Alberta. Grandpa Neufeld was not only a farmer, he was also a school teacher. Abe loved school and he was particularly fond of his teacher, Miss Smart. It was a mixed farm, but the main livelihood was from harvesting grain, and they depended on horses to get the work done. Abe loved his pony and was proud of it. The age of the automobile had come, and Abe was very jealous of his brother Jake, who brought home a 1925 Grey Dort, an automobile built entirely in Canada. The family grew, and here is Abe in 1925 when he was 16. The Neufelds were a handsome family. This picture was taken just before Tina got married. Abe was more concerned about relaxing than looking for a wife, yet. The farmhouse and outbuildings were located in the middle of a section of land. Life on the homestead was busy and everyone had a job to do. One of the most labor-intensive jobs was at harvest season when all the menfolk would cut down and bind the grain into sheaves, stack them in stooks to dry, and then load them in the threshing machine. The women cooked all day for their hungry threshing crew. Abe was 19 years old when his father Jacob died in 1928. After attending a school board meeting, Jacob came home in a lot of pain, went to bed and called his family around him. He lifted his hands to the ceiling and asked if they could hear the angels singing. Then he died. This death profoundly affected Abe. But there was still lots of work to do. Fences had to be built from pole logs cut from forest and nearby foothills. And there was still time for fun. Since times were hard, Abe had to leave home and find work to support himself. He had difficulty with his eyesight and traveled to a doctor in Calgary for a series of treatments. He felt lonely, discouraged, and abandoned by his family. He lived on practically nothing for several weeks, and he worried that he might go blind and die. But God had other plans. At that time, the Holiness Movement was coming to rural Alberta in tent meetings, complete with stirring ad-lib sermons, ragtime pianos, and sawdust on the floor. This shocked the established churches who listened to red sermons, had no musical instruments, and sang dreary old hymns in unison. But it fascinated young people like Abe. A new sect called the Mennonite Brethren in Christ came to town and set up a revival camp meeting. Abe went forward at the altar and got saved. He experienced a second act of grace termed sanctification and became full of zeal to share his faith. He previously had ambitions to become a businessman, but he felt strongly the call to preach the gospel. This required three years at Mountain View Bible College in nearby Didsbury. He put himself through school by working on farms for $10 a month, 
Meanwhile, his two younger brothers were struggling to hang on to the family farm during the Great Depression when they lost three years of crops due to hail. The old Mennonites did not believe in a paid clergy, and Abe's mother could not understand his passion neglect the farm to become a preacher. But his sister Anna also joined a new sect, motivated in part by her romance with the handsome Virgil Snyder, who was a pastor. Abe enjoyed his time at Mountain View Bible College. He even joined a group of students who helped to build the Cremona Church, where he was later married, and 30 years later to be the pastor who renovated the building. While at Bible College, Abe met Ruth Lewis and they fell in love. Abe graduated with honors in 1933. His classmates were Harold Stollery, Bill Purdy, Beatrice Bremen, Celestine Spees, Maple Shantz, Merlin Grace Baker. Abe kept in touch with them for nearly 60 years until he outlived them all. In this picture of the faculty and graduating class, mention needs to be made of Mary Finley. She was a missionary widow seated on the front left, and she was later to have a very profound effect on Abe's life. Here is Abe's sweetheart Ruth with two friends. The girl in the front, Madeline Deagles, soon became Ruth's bridemaid. Abe's brother Neil married Martha Eitzen in 1933. His brother Martin married Ann Harder in 1934. Abe always loved cars. Here he is with his 29 Chevy Coupe. He loved to tinker with cars like this one here with Ruth's brother-in-law, Gordon Sherrick. Ruth graduated from Mountain View Bible College in 1935. Just prior to accepting his first call to the ministry, he married Ruth in her home church of Cremona, Alberta on June 12, 1935. Then they moved to James River, west of Red Deer, Alberta, where he was a circuit preacher. The trip to the three congregations was about 40 miles, and they covered that every Sunday in a horse-drawn wagon in the summer and a sleigh in the winter. And this was during the Great Depression, which was a time of great poverty for everyone. But in the first year, they only received $10 in the collection. 1936 was a better year. They got $25 but they still buttered their bread with lard and lived on honeymoon salad, which was lettuce alone. Abe's first convert was Chester Burke. Chester went on to marry Delina and became a missionary in the Belgian Congo. When the Congo was granted independence, anarchy broke out and poor Chester was martyred for his faith and Delina was imprisoned and tortured. Abe's brother-in-law, Virgil Snyder, husband of his sister Anna, had gone on to seminary in Marion, Indiana and was encouraging Abe to do likewise. Others were encouraging him to go to Chicago Evangelistic Institute. Abe was earnestly seeking God's direction. So one spring day, he was plowing a field with a horse-drawn plow and he was praying for guidance. Suddenly, he heard an audible voice from heaven say very clearly, Go, go to, to Nampa. Nampa. Now this meant nothing to him. But when he related the story to the farmer that he worked for, the man said, Nampa, Idaho is where Northwest Nazarene Bible College is located. So Abe completed his three years of probation and was ordained as ministering elder in the Mennonite Brethren in Christ Church in 1938. Ruth was also ordained an approved ministering sister. The Church of the Nazarene was another holiness sect of the Methodists, and there was considerable rivalry between the holiness groups. But Abe was sure that this was a word from the Lord. So, totally penniless, Abe and Ruth decided to trust the Lord for the resources. At their farewell gathering, the church young people gave them a purse that contained the exact amount of cash that they needed for bus fare to Nampa, Idaho. Ruth met a handicapped woman on the bus, and she assisted her as much as possible. When they arrived to Nampa, the woman was greeted by her husband, who had arrived in a chauffeur-driven limousine. She told her husband how helpful and kind the Canadians had been, so he asked if he could help them. And when he learned that they were poor college students looking for a place to live and a job, he gave them jobs and a place to live. While Abe attended Northwest Nazarene College, he found another position as an interim pastor of a Methodist church. His brother-in-law, Virgil Snyder, and his growing family had moved back east, and he was a professor at Emmanuel Bible College in Kitchener, Ontario. Even his baby sister, Beth, got married. Abe was homesick, and he often drove the thousand miles back to Alberta to visit his relatives and keep in touch with his church friends. He was anxious to serve in the Mennonite Brethren in Christ Church again. The Whitehead family in Roy, Washington, south of Seattle, was also interested in the Newfelds, and they were called to plant a church in Roy. 
Abe and Ruth returned to Canada to work on their immigration papers, but the officials in Calgary were anything but helpful. Mr. Whitehead even offered to put up his whole farm as collateral in order to convince the bureaucrats that the Newfelds would not become a burden to the USA. Finally, someone told him that the American consulate in Vancouver, BC was much easier to deal with. So in the middle of winter, February, they set off to the coast in his 1929 Chevy Coupe, heading over the Big Bend Highway, which back then wasn't much more than a one-lane logging road for 300 miles through the mountains. So they drove through the blinding snowstorm and several times had to back up in order to let logging trucks pass. Well, they finally arrived in Roy, Washington in 1939, and they stayed there for 10 years under the shadow of Mount Rainier. While there, the congregation grew, and they built a new church and parsonage. Roy was on the edge of Fort Lewis Army Base. Abe was out there during the Second World War, and he officiated over the funerals of many young men who died in the Pacific conflict, especially Pearl Harbor. So Abe was now the district superintendent, or bishop, for the Northwest Conference of the Mennonite Brethren in Christ Church. This required frequent trips to conferences in Ontario, Indiana, and Michigan. He would often take the train back east, and Ruth would preach in his absence. But she refused to do weddings or funerals. Passionate lovers had to be patient, and the deceased had to be put on ice until Abe returned. He would then drive some new vehicle back from the factory in Michigan, for a car dealer who worked in the congregation. Another visit to family and friends in Canada. He had increasing amounts of nieces and nephews, but still no children of his own. There was no way that he could ever catch up to his brother Jake. Abe and Ruth were never blessed with a child, so before leaving Canada, they had put their name on the waiting list for an adoption from the Beulah Home Cottage for babies from unwed mothers. Director Mrs. Mary Finley phoned them in 1948 to tell them that she had a cute little Polish baby that she would save for them if they could come right away. So Ruth took the train back to Edmonton and picked up the baby, who she named Barry Lynn Newfelds. Ruth returned with the baby and her mother Rosetta Lewis and mother-in-law Katharina Neufeld to Roy Washington. Abe and Ruth moved from Washington to southern Idaho in 1949. Abe doted on his son and loved him dearly. They loved living in the USA and they were prospering due to the Americans' gratitude and generosity. He was a beloved pastor and made many new converts. It was during this time that the denomination decided to change its name to the United Missionary Church. They lived in Filer, Idaho, and then nearby Twin Falls, Idaho. His efforts were recognized by the well-established United Missionary Church in Edmonton, Alberta, and they moved there in 1952. Abe's mother died before he had really experienced reconciliation with her. He was strict with others, but he was even harder on himself. A spirit of melancholy came over him, and two years later he was forced to resign due to a nervous breakdown. Abe and Ruth headed back to the United States but got sidetracked due to his health and inability to travel. They ended up buying a small hobby farm in the Okanagan Valley, just east of Vernon, B.C. They attended the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church. Abe assisted with Bible classes and discipling new believers. Abe worked as a farmer and a logger, hauling logs out of the forest with a horse and at the Lumbee Sawmill. The time had come to begin tying the knot for his nieces. Here is Donna's wedding in 1954 and Nadine's wedding in 1956. But Abe's heart was in the ministry, and after three years he was ready to return to his beloved pastorate, sharing the gospel with the lost and saving souls. In 1958 they accepted a call to Cremona, Alberta, Ruth's hometown. The congregation grew dramatically. While there, they modernized, remodeled, and moved the church building to a new location. Abe and Ruth celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary in the church where they were married. Only one problem, Ruth had come down with the mumps which she caught from Barry, so she celebrated in bed. Abe had health problems with a perforated ulcer that was made worse by an inebriated country surgeon called out in the middle of the night. But after further surgery in Calgary, he recovered during a vacation in the Okanagan. Since this area was so good for his health, they accepted a call to Winfield, B.C., just north of Kelowna. After Barry left home for university in 1967, 
Abe accepted a call to Bowdoin, Alberta. There followed short pastorates in Sundry and May City, Alberta, just east of Oles. But they wanted to be closer to their grandchildren. They finally retired to Kelowna, BC in 1974 and attended his former pastor at the Winfield Missionary Church, now pastored by Gene Whitehead, the grandson of the man who had been so supportive when they moved to the USA 30 years earlier. They loved to keep busy gardening, vegetables, flowers, fruit, entertaining friends and relatives. They also organized a senior social group, which they called the Keenagers. Abe was proud to attend Barry's graduation from Simon Fraser University. And he was proud of his only grandson, Jonathan, born the following year. Soon Natasha joined the family, who regularly visited Grandpa's house. In June of 1985, Abe and Ruth celebrated 50 years of marriage. Relatives organized a party in Didsbury, Alberta, and friends in Kelowna also threw a party. The next year, they attended Martina's high school graduation in Abbotsford. In 1987, Abe and Ruth spent their last Christmas together with Barry and their grandchildren, Jonathan and Natasha. Ruth's health began to falter and she passed away in 1988 due to cancer. They had been married for 53 years. Abe's faith was really shaken because he always believed in and preached divine healing, but the Lord saw fit to let Ruth suffer and die. But the day after the funeral, Abe had the joy of baptizing his grandson, Jonathan, in the Didsbury Church. After a short time as an Olympic athlete hopeful, Abe grew tired of batching it and eating burnt donuts. He wanted to get back into the routine of married life. Abe met Helen Luer, Nee Braun, at the Winfield Missionary Church. They were married on Remembrance Day, 1989. Helen felt it was an honor to take care of one of God's servants, and since she was younger than Abe, she promised to care for Abe until he died. They settled in Kelowna. They enjoyed vacations in their RV and even cruises to Hawaii and the Caribbean together. In 1997, Abe attended Jonathan's high school graduation in Chilliwack, where he met Rose Wood, the woman who had given birth to Barry. He thanked her for bringing Barry into the world. Rose thanked Abe for doing such a good job of raising Barry. Abe was overjoyed that Martina had kept up the family tradition and gone to Rocky Mountain College, which was formerly his alma mater, Mountain View. In 1998, Helen threw a huge party for Abe's 90th birthday. Friends and relatives came from miles around. Abe even outlasted two of his nephews, Norman Harder, son of his sister Kina, and Ernie Neufeld, son of his brother Martin.
Here's Abe entertaining Barry's biological nephew, Andrew, son of Barry's half-brother, Dan Wood. celebrating his 91st birthday at Apex Mountain Ranch. Abe was proud of Helen's involvement with the Golden Nuggets. They came over in 2003 to help him celebrate his 95th birthday.
I missed it. Sorry. Here, put it in again. Dad, did you get one with my other camera? No, it says low light. Well, it didn't. It didn't do like quite like it should have. No, it didn't do as well. Supposed to jump out at you, right at you. Is it good? However, as Abe grew older, his hearing began to fail first, then his balance, and finally his memory. But the treatments he received as a young man in Calgary many years earlier must have been effective. His eyesight remained clear, and he read his Bible daily until the end. He had outlived all his friends and siblings. He was totally dependent on Helen, and he loved her dearly. He could not say enough good about her. He was so proud that two of his grandchildren were in full-time service for the Lord. Martina, the eldest, graduated from Rocky Mountain College and went on a scholarship to McMaster Divinity School, now works for Yahweh, a Christian internet community. Jonathan graduated from Trinity Western University and served in Europe as technical support for Arab World Ministries, communicating the gospel to Muslims. Celia is married and lives in Vienna, Austria, and Natasha lives in Grand Prairie, Alberta. When Helen became ill with a problem that required surgery, Abe was totally lost. He could not cope without her and he had to be hospitalized on November the 8th, 2006. He became increasingly unresponsive and the two lovebirds had to spend their 17th anniversary apart in separate hotel rooms. Helen was released from the hospital on November 17, 2006. Abe's niece, Arlene Snyder, Anna's daughter, arrived immediately and began to care for her aunt. The hospital beckoned them to Abe's bedside on November 22nd. His vital signs were failing and he was slipping away. Both Helen and Arlene were with Abraham, caressing him and talking to him when he finally stopped breathing and peacefully went to be with his Lord at 9.30 p.m. Helen kept her promise. Funeral services were held at the Disbury, Alberta, Zion Evangelical Missionary Church Tuesday, November 28, 2006. Internment followed in the Didsbury Cemetery. A memorial service was held at the Ridgeview Evangelical Missionary Church in Kelowna, B.C. on December the 2nd, 2006. The following little video clip is dedicated to the memory of my late mother, Ruth Neufeld. I appreciate mom for making this possible by finding a way so I could take piano lessons and encouraging me to persist in practicing. Here's a picture of mom by the shore of Emerald Lake in the Rockies. Her most favorite hymn was Oh to be like thee, which she sang often as a solo in church. She meant every word for it was truly the prayer of her life. Thomas Chisholm wrote the lyrics and the music was composed by William Kirkpatrick. Thomas Obadiah Chisholm grew up in a small community in Kentucky and attended a small one-room school. He became the school teacher at age 16. He was saved under the ministry of Dr. Henry Clay Morrison of Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky. Thomas enjoyed journalism, so Dr. Morrison encouraged him to become the editor of the Pentecostal Herald, the main periodical of the Holiness Movement. Thomas Chisholm was ordained a Methodist minister, but he served only briefly due to ill health. He moved his family to Winona Lake, Indiana, where he worked as an insurance salesman and wrote over a thousand poems, most of which were set to music. Some of his more well-known hymns were Great is Thy Faithfulness, Living for Jesus, What Would We Do Without Jesus, and of course, O To Be Like Thee. William Kirkpatrick was trained to be a carpenter, but I'm glad he became a musician. As a member of the Methodist Episcopal Church and the Hayden and Handel Societies in Philadelphia, he was a classical musician. He played the violin and cello, which were in great demand before pipe organs became popular in churches. Some of his best known hymns are, Blessed be the name, the comforter has come, give me thy heart, he hideth my soul, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, and you may have the joy bells ringing in your heart. 
I think Chisholm and Kirkpatrick would have enjoyed this my own performance and arrangement of Oh To Be Like Thee. It begins with a pan flute solo, then Hammond organ, and in the third verse I make use of a trio of violin, viola, and cello. The fourth verse is a piano solo, and the song ends with a full string section. The unusual 9-8 rhythm is kept up with a harp and a guitar. All of the music, graphics, and karaoke text were sequenced using a synthesizer and two digital computers. Although O To Be Like Thee appeared in the Young People's Hymnal in 1897, it was far ahead of its time. In those days, churches were used to singing stodgy old anthems in unison and rarely with musical instruments.